Well, I'm dealing with a very uh, old-fashioned topic, so I'm going to use some chalk, too, to show how old-fashioned I, I still am. Um, I'll just put this up. This is not the uh, liberal, virtuous triangle that gets us world peace. Uh, this is the hierarchical system that power transition theory uh, talks about, and which I'm going to talk about, but so I'm just going to do this quick diagram. Here we have the dominant power. Here we have the great powers. Here we have middle powers, and uh, I didn't invent all this language, small powers. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Dukovic uh, very much. Uh, I think he's probably one of the few people that could get people to work on a research paper in the middle of final exams. Uh, most would, the answer would have been no. Uh, two, uh, this is a very uh, different paper uh, for me, um, rather than a research-driven paper. Uh, it's actually uh, a result of the courses I've been teaching. Uh, uh, Causes of War, which is my bread and butter course. And for the last two years, I've taught this uh, wonderful course on the rise and fall of American hegemony. And I've been blessed with having some of the best students I've ever had in my career in both classes. Uh, so a lot of this is coming from my teaching. Um, and if it is a paper, it is in the uh, very beginning developmental stages. So my basic topic is uh, the rise of China and the likelihood of major war between the United States and China and its respective allies. I argue that of all the issues contributing to the grand split, the rise of China is paramount. And uh, we are witnessing, I would argue, a pretty significant power shift in the relative distribution of power, uh, certainly the rise of China, uh, and or the decline of the United States. Uh, for at least the last 20 plus years, China's remarkable economic growth has, uh, and uh, increasing military capabilities has been headline news uh, that policymakers, academics, and students have focused on. Uh, the rise of China is having enormous consequences for other countries' foreign policies, including the countries in the region, such as the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, the United States and uh, the pivot, uh, and Australia, who is increasingly nervous about a growing China. It has also raised the likelihood of major war. And here we've come full circle. Uh, 1989, Francis Fukuyama uh, proclaimed the end of history and that the biggest issue we'd have to deal with was boredom. Uh, the idea of war in Europe was seen as nonsensical something a few dinosaur realists talked about, and that the future looked like a very bright, uh, peace-loving, democratic community um, and all. But in a relatively short period of time, uh, we've gone from that to a plethora of books, articles, war game strategies, war game scenarios, policy changes uh, that forecast an impending war between the United States and, and China. And not only that, of course, we have a major war in Ukraine. We have a major war in Gaza that has great potential to become a greater Middle Eastern war. Uh, so that's the gloom and doom. So the outline of my paper are basically two aims. Uh, the first is to examine the possibility of a major war between the United States and China. And secondly, to see what can be done to lessen the possibility uh, that the current power transition that we're underway, this rise and fall power dynamic, does not result in major war, whereas it often has in the past. Um, so I do assume uh, that we are in the midst of a power transition, and so that's when we're talking about the work of uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Organsky, uh, who was the principal uh, uh, developer of power transition theory in the 1950s. Uh, and the power transition school has gotten a, a, a great uh, boost in recent years because they seem to uh, capture what's going on uh, quite remarkably. Uh, so three sections. Uh, first is to provide some data on China's growing economic and military capabilities. Uh, I am aware that uh, some of these indicators recently have gone in the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, I had a student write a wonderful paper showing that the United States is pushing far, far ahead of China and that China's having all kinds of problems economically, in terms of population. So I'm aware of all that, 
but I'm going to call myself a China rising optimist, uh, which may partly stem from the wonderful trip I was able to take with Piotr to China before COVID. And when I saw Shanghai, uh, literally my brain just did something differently. I just could not really capture what I was actually seeing and experiencing uh, in China. Uh, secondly, I review the literature of those who make the argument that significant changes, changes in the distribution of power are causally related to the outbreak of major war. And here again, my primary focus is on Organsky and the Power Transition School, uh, which follows from his 1958 book, World Politics. Uh, and give the story away a little bit. Uh, rising dissatisfied powers are big time trouble. <laughs> are, are, uh, so if China does fit that bill, uh, you know, the idea of great power war is not as uh, far-fetched as some might want to believe. And three, which is kind of unusual for my, myself, uh, I try to infuse the paper with some optimism uh, and I revisit the work uh, that was being done in the 1930s and 40s on this idea of peaceful change, right, of how to, ha how to do accommodation. How do you get change in international politics without war? Uh, and this was a big theme of the interwar scholars. And in the little time I've had to research this, uh, not a complete surprise, there's a lot of people still working on this concept of peaceful change. And there's an entire Oxford handbook on peaceful change that I've discovered. Um, OK, so do this pretty fast. Uh, economic data. Uh, until most recently, China's been experiencing double-digit economic growth. And most economists did predict by 2025, China would have the second largest economy uh, in the world. Uh, since the onset of the Great Recession, China has successfully taken top position in world exports, passing Germany, in trade, passing the United States, and in manufacturing, a claim that the United States has had for about a century. Uh, China's goods and exports continue to rise 7% from 2021, and China's global surplus to, is around $877 billion. Uh, Realism 101 is that countries that are growing economically convert some of that power to their military. And here there's great evidence to, uh, to show that that is in fact what China has been doing. Uh, in a 2023 U.S. Department of Defense report to Congress, it was reported that China's 2022 defense budget continued more than 20 years of annual defense spending increases and puts the People's Republic China's position as the second largest military spender in the world after the United States. Uh, the report further notes that the defense budget has nearly doubled in the last decade, uh, indicating that 2013 through 2022, China's annual budget has grown by 6%, adjusting for inflation. They have the, at large, they have the world's largest active military force, comprised of about 2.185 million uh, people in the reserves, 1.17 mil, no, active, excuse me, 2.185 million active people in the military, 1.7 million reservists, 660,000 paramilitary personnel, uh, on and on and on. China has their first aircraft carrier. China is working on military technology to project power. Uh, the United States often seems to have been the only country that can project power over long distances. China is increasingly developing those capabilities to their Air Force, Navy, et cetera. And yes, the one-child policy and the aging issue is certainly something I need to take into account. But you know, on paper, 1.4 billion people compared to the United States is roughly 350 million people. Uh, and power transition theory is going to argue that population is one of the key ingredients uh, for great power status. OK, so power transition theory. Uh, so I usually take about three hours to do this when I lecture. Uh, so I'm going to do this in about five minutes. <laughs> uh, so one of the big things of uh, how these folks differ than classical realist people is that they argue that a hierarchy of power basically helps to keep the peace. Uh, Realism 101 basically says that if states are roughly equal and there's a balance of power, we should see much less war because no one's going to actually win if everybody's equal. Uh, actually, power transition theory says that when we get to a degree of inequality, that is another real danger zone. 
So when you're all, you know, back in the early day when the United States was clearly on top, the idea that great power war was pretty much impossible. Most of the great powers were status quo states that supported the United States. And even if these states have revisionist aims, they have no capability to do much about it. Right? So this is a relatively tranquil system. It's when we start seeing shifts in the players, especially great powers rising, challenging the dominant state, that this school of thought says this is what makes war uh, uh, more likely. So hierarchy rather than equilibrium, and uh, it's going to identify rising states as the big problem, where other theories, you know, the declining state, da 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 da, but power transition theory definitely says <clears throat> that the rising state is the, uh, the country we need to focus on. Okay, so uh, briefly, there's four parts to power transition theory, right? One is structure, and that is my complicated diagram here. Uh, a hierarchical distribution of power, right? When all the states clearly recognize the dominant power. Now, quite interestingly, they do not word, use the word hegemony. They do not use, you know, so Robert Gilpin, some of you might know that, they use the word dominant state. Um, I did, I wrote, yes, thanks to you, uh, again. Um, and this dominant state uses its power to create an international order that is greatly beneficial to itself, right? Its interests are, you know, in part of this order. It can't be just completely that way because you got to get other countries to go along. But, you know, uh, it could, you could even, you know, Eikenberry is a liberal internationalist, but Eikenberry sees the same role that hegemons, which he calls them, create international orders to reflect their interest and everything is fine and dandy when there's a hegemon. Um, so inequalities of power is the problem uh, for our power transition theory in terms of their structural argument. Uh, power is uh, another key ingredient. Uh, we've, you know, political science is largely, we could say, used to be largely about power, but over 150 years of political science, you know, drives undergraduates and us crazy, what is power? And just book after book on what is power. Uh, they identify three elements of power. Uh, so one, population. Uh, specifically, the number who can work and fight. That's what we want people to do. Uh, uh, power is the ability to impose or persuade an opponent to comply with demands. So it's very much that kind of, you know, I exercise influence of you, I make you do something that you would not otherwise want to do. So in a function of population, Two is economic productivity, the rate of industrialization, uh, different numbers, but usually gross domestic product per capita is the measurement used. And C, this is a bit more of a, uh, ambiguous, uh, but it's the effectiveness of the political system to extract resources. So we might have strong states, weak states, but you know, a state that can tax the population, can mobilize resources for it to uh, build aircraft carriers. Um, and it's the shift in power relations that has serious consequences for international stability. Uh, and it draws upon this old, you know, Paul Kennedy's rise and fall of great powers, Robert Gilpin's hegemonic theory of war, uh, but this idea of the law of uneven growth, right? All countries do not grow at the same rate, a whole bunch of different factors, but some rates grow at a faster rate than others. Uh, and the argument here is that this is in fact what was happening with regard to China. So uh, why conflict? There's two, two key uh, things here. One is the concept of parity, uh, which according to power transition theory exists when a great power becomes a challenger and develops more than 80% of the resources of the dominant power. So there, there really is a formula aspect to this, you know, but so 80%, which once you start to catch your 80%, you're at the level of parity. That's danger, danger. Real danger is overtaking. That's the other key concept. Uh, this occurs when a rising power develops economically at a faster rate than the dominant power. Right? Um, so it could be changes in industrialization, changes in technology, changes in worker productivity, et cetera, et cetera, um, that can trigger this. Now, the other thing that I find very interesting about power transition theory is this, this third element the degree of satisfaction or dissatisfaction that the rising power might have, right? 
So basically, you know, this is not just uh, true to power transition theory, but it sees a world of status quo states, happy with the existing order, they basically get their interests realized more often than not, and they are willing to go along with the existing system. The other types of state are dissatisfied revisionist states. They don't believe they're getting their fair share of the spoils, don't believe the international order reflects uh, their own interests, and if they could change it, they would change it. By definition, the dominant power is a status quo satisfied state. Right? They, right? They're, uh, in the United States, we call it king of the hill. Uh, in Canada, I call it king of the castle. Uh, the snow, when we used to have snow, you stand on the castle, and if you're on the top, you stay there, and you try to kick everybody or push or wish people to not come up. Uh, but those are the revisionist challengers. Um, and the dominant power wants to stay on top of the castle. Um, so, um, this begs the question, uh, I mean, power transition theorists basically argue that, A, we are at uh, parity, and we're very close to overtaking. So, the $20 question becomes, is China a satisfied status quo power, or is China a revisionist power? Uh, and we could take this both ways. I mean, one side of the story is that China is a status quo state. Uh, it's benefited from the liberal international order. Uh, it wants to make a few changes, but it's gone rich and strong by being part of the WTO, thanks to President Clinton. Uh, and so it can be accommodated, whatever, whatever. The other side is that would be like uh, uh, Chris Lane calls the idea of benevolent hegemon the unicorn theory. Like, have you, ever, you know, have you ever seen a benevolent hegemon? Have you ever seen a unicorn? Uh, so the idea that China is not revisionist uh, would seem to be the possible unicorn theory, right? That if you are a rising power, that you've been uh, opposed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, opposed to these other types of things, have a history of being pummeled by the West, it would be kind of shocking that China would not like to change the existing international order and have it more aligned with its values, interests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I got a few more minutes. Um, so the question becomes, can this war be avoided? And in power transition theory, I would just say a couple things. One, and this is maybe where they are a little nutty, uh, this can happen even with nuclear weapons. Right. So many of our theories of war say, yes, that was a good theory in the 1800s, but with nuclear weapons, all of that's off the board. Right. Power transition theory and myself, I do not accept that. I think it will be a miracle if nuclear weapons are not used before I die. Um, two, um, they believe this is underway. Right? And the question is, can the West do anything to accommodate China? And if it does not, there likely will be a war. Maybe it will be an inadvertent war that triggers from Taiwan on and on, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I got like a two minutes. Anyway, some of this really just goes back all the way to Thucydides, right? So everyone's totally lost, right? The, so the history of the Peloponnesian War, you know, you read that 500 page book. Uh, uh, but there's one line that people love, you know, why did the war start? The growth of Athenian power and the fear this caused in Sparta, right? And so. So people say, ah, that was an insight. Um, and Graham Allison at Harvard University has this article and book called The Thucydides Trap, which some of you probably know. And uh, him and his Harvard team uh, argue that 15 of the last 19 power transitions have resulted in major war. And they are pretty grim about the prospects of us avoiding uh, a major war in the future. OK, so uh, to do total injustice, uh, peaceful change which is the third uh, area of my paper. Uh, this again springs from E.H. Carr's The 20 Years Crisis. And in the chapter before the conclusion, he has a chapter on peaceful change, right? And he defines peaceful change as how in national politics, how to have change without revolution, and in international politics, uh, how to have change without war, right? And part of his whole idealism, realism, schism, creation, uh, is an attempt to, when we get to the problem of peaceful change, that you have to have both elements, right? You need to have a moral foundation and a power foundation to try to search for the right place in which you can have peaceful change. Um, now, interestingly, Carr thought that appeasement, 
of uh, Chamberlain to uh, Hitler was a good example of what he was getting at. Right? Interestingly enough, that's one of the few passages that no longer is found in any of the subsequent editions. I was eliminated after the 1939 book. Uh, and this is also when appeasement got its bad name. Right? So peaceful change, and there's been a lot of work on appeasement. You know, is appeasement always a dirty word? Right? Is giving into the demands of a rising power always a bad thing to do? You know, I've not, I don't have the verdict on that, but it's something to think about. Uh, again, conventional wisdom is you never do this, uh, but if we're in unconventional times, uh, that maybe some of that would be involved. Uh, again, Carr was not alone. Uh, the guy, guy Frederick Sherwin Dunn, he wrote a book in 1937 called Peaceful Change, and he defined it as the alteration of the status quo by peaceful international procedures rather than by force. Uh, the work of the International Studies Conference in the interwar period, which some people is the predecessor to the International Studies Association, had conference after conference on peaceful change. Right? Would it be through adjudication? Would it be through legal means? Would it be through give and take? But here's the idea that you know, if you want to avoid war, uh, you might have to do some concession, some accommodation, if the war is going to be so her terrible to avoid it. So that's my optimism part and uh, still needs more development. But so we have power transition theory on the one hand, very, very pessimistic about war coming. Uh, peaceful change does recognize a power transition is happening, but does not, you know, thinks there's still things that we can actually do uh, to perhaps diminish the possibility of a major war between the United States and China. So, thank you very much.